And I guess uh, let's let's take it away. All right, uh, hey everybody, uh, welcome to the kickoff meeting for the uh, IPFS and DAPS working group uh, on November twenty eighth. Um, so I guess a high level, uh, this this group sort of uh, came came about to uh, realizing that there's a bunch of DAPS that are distributed, some with IPFS, some uh, some not, um, but that ultimately they have these uh, choke points on the the front end of the DAP. Um, even when the back end tends to be a decentralized thing like a blockchain. Um, and that it seems like we're very close to having the tools to solve this problem. Um, if we put in some effort as a, as a community to to work at it. Um, and for bonus points, um, within uh, some segments of, of our community, uh, there are some regulators that have decided that they want to help us out uh, by <laughs> heavily incentivizing uh, decentralized systems to be more decentralized. Um, and so now seems like a pretty good time to do this, um, given that it's sort of the the tech the tools are further along and the incentives are sort of aligning into the right place. Um, and uh, had some some conversations with uh, with Ed. Uh, from Liquidity about the fact they were kind of already working towards doing this um, and and chatted with some other people um, in, in, you know, uh, you know DevConnect Prague. Uh, and it seems like there's a bunch of people that are kind of working around this area. Um, and we should create a space for us to sort of see what each other are up to and um, make, make progress together. Um, so with that, I guess we'll maybe intro the people around the uh go around the room, uh and say, you know, who they are, um, kind of what they're what they work on or are interested in here. Um, and then we'll go to some discussion topics, which are in the notes, uh, which have been posted, but I will uh I guess share my screen after everyone's done with their intros. Um, and I guess I'll start. Uh my name is uh Adin Schmoman. Um I've been working uh, on IPFS um, within uh, Protocol Labs and now the, the IPFS Shipyard team for about uh, five years now. And um, looks like a lot of people are moving around hash link data. And I just kind of want to see this work uh, in a decentralized way uh, as, as people have been asking for for a few years. And I think we're close, so let's do it. Um, I guess everyone should just nominate nominate the next person. So I'm going to nominate uh, Russell because he is next on my screen. Cool. Thanks, Adine. Yeah, my name's uh, Russell Sergeant Pookie everywhere online for those who don't know. Um, I do TypeScript and JavaScript stuff on the front end and back end. I've been working on Helia lately, which uh, should align pretty closely with uh, building IPFS dApps. Um, so hoping to help out from that direction. I'm also pretty uh, interested. I'm new to P2P stuff as of like two years ago, but really interested in um, decentralized solutions for users and self-sovereign things. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll go with uh, Dave. Hey, um, Dave Justice. I haven't updated my Zoom thing in a while. Um... I mostly work with uh, browser integrations um, and other platforms. So we have like a mobile app called Durin. We test out some of the IPFS stuff there. Um, and then I've been most recently working with Brave Browser. So mostly those sorts of things, browsers, platforms, integrations, a little bit with standards boards, and then um, <clears throat> just general ecosystem stuff. Uh, next we'll do Daniel Norman. Thanks, David. Um... I'm Daniel, developer advocate for IPFS, and uh, my background is is quite broad in in software and and at PL I've been kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to IPFS, but really trying to serve as 
some kind of a conduit between a lot of the deep engineering work and the broader community uh, through communication, content creation, and just general ecosystem work. And uh, with that, I'll pass over to Ed. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, I'm Ed from Liquidity Protocol, um, which is like a stablecoin project running on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, I'm a software engineer there and I've been in software for uh, 10 years or so. And uh, yeah, the reason I'm here is because we, when we were trying to create decentralized protocol, the part of the stack that was hardest to decentralize was actually the front end side. So when we launched, we went with a distributed model, which has worked. But for our next protocol we're working on, we're looking to really improve the uh, front end decentralization so yeah that's how i've connected with you guys i will nominate uh who's not been yanis hi everyone um i'm yanis i uh, work very closely with the ipfs team um uh, and we also have the, the problem team that i'm um yeah i'm core member of and the problem team is doing uh, measurements around um, LIPID-based networks, IPFS in particular, but also uh, other applications that build uh, on top of IPFS. Uh, and therefore, yeah, that's kind of why I'm interested in this group. Um, I want to know uh, all things about DAPs and what can go into the back end that um, uh, Adin mentioned in the beginning uh, and see what are the best practices and non-best practices uh, and so on. Um, yeah, I think I'm not forgetting anything. I've been around for a while. So um, yeah, I'm familiar with IPFS and LPTP protocols. And then uh, I will pass it over to uh, Luke. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Luke. Um, yes, yeah, so I've I've been uh, well working on sort of blockchain for uh, probably four four or five years now. Um, started with Ethereum doing DApps, and then um, then I've had to add an opportunity working with Parity doing uh, I was doing like their Polkadot JS. Um, and yeah, and beyond that, um, I, like traditionally I've been doing like front end developer. Um, I've done back end jobs as well. But when I've been doing DAPs, I don't necessarily think I've been doing all the. Never really fully understood how how um, well I've been doing the the decentralized component, like with using IPFS. I've I've used Pinata in a hackathon and uh, that kind of stuff. But um, you know, I think covering things like security and and you know understanding how decentralized things are, that's uh, I think a gap that could be filled. Uh, so looking forward to learning more about that. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I'll choose the next person would be uh, Liddell. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm working on IPFS <laughs> uh, within the IPFS shipyard group, uh, IPFS stewards, uh, <laughs> recent focus on specs and HTTP story with a tilt towards uh, IPFS being used uh, for things like website hosting and being part of the web platform. Uh, so kind of like in between specifications and implementations that uh, improve IPFS presence on the web. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, Andrik? Yeah. Hello, I'm Andrik. Uh yeah, I've been working also on the IPFS stewards team uh, in Kubo Box, so more on the gateways and the routing side of things lately. And yeah, I decided to join this call just because I'm interested interested to know what's happening around here. I don't know if anyone's missing. No, that's that's everybody. No. Thanks. Well, uh, then back to thanks. you. <laughs> thanks everybody. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh... So good things. I'll, I'll add to a couple of things people have, have said, call out. Uh, so uh, the the ProBlab folks have put together some some tools to help us with like uh, sort of website monitoring performance on on 
Um, you know, like how does it work when people load things through IPFS.io? How does it work when people load things through a local, a local Kubo node and like what that looks like? I suspect the next iteration of this is we have to see, even once we can get all the things loaded into the browser, one of the things people are going to ask is, what does the performance look like when you force all of the work client side uh, into the browser, right? Instead of delegating it all to some like, you know, go process somewhere else, right? Um, I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that's going to be a question we're interested in. Um, and, and also, uh, Henrik has, has done a lot of, a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of, uh, bat plumbing work to, you know, for these, these protocols and changes around, you know, their routing and gateways that sort of help us move closer to, uh, to where we, where we go, uh, to try and move, move more of this into the browser, um, with Lytle driving lots and lots of specs, <laughs> which is very appreciated. Um, I think the first thing on the discussion topic here, and I guess now is my turn to share my screen. Um, all right, uh, highest priority items from now until the end of the year. Um, so I guess maybe a place to start is I think that... Um, you know, I, and we've had some discussions on, on sort of like a, a POC things that we can start getting people to like, start use and and give feedback on, um, and so figuring out sort of what we need to get that to a place where we feel comfortable like, getting people to, start giving us, uh, yeah, start giving us their feedback on like what, what works from this from like a, or doesn't from a UX perspective. Um, because, and I won't go too much into what are some example dApps that have issues, but there are a bunch that even when they do distribute their data through, uh, their front ends through IPFS tooling, um, they use, that's like the, that's like the backup plan or the, or the plan B in a bunch of ways, uh, that tends to fall apart when someone has, like their website goes down. Um, sometimes they use DNS link and then that helps out or ENS sometimes and that helps out. Sometimes it's just like, you know, dap.com and then dap.com goes down and that's the end of that, right? Um, and probably there's like, the, the reason why they're choosing to do this now is that there's some like, um, some UX hurdle or or some concern that's like, you know, stopping stopping them from making the jump to sort of adding the more decentralized, resilient approach to their front end distribution. So I feel like that's kind of like the thing we're running at is like how do we how do we make that easy for people and let them give feedback and say it's good enough, it's not good enough. Um, so I don't know if Ed, if there's anything like top of mind. I know Lytle and I have done a little bit of brainstorming and drafting here. Um, but yeah, anything that's top of mind for you? Yeah, I mean, that note above is really like such a good point because like ideally, like I don't want to, and I don't think anyone like wants to be making these like custom solutions or like interim solutions. Ideally browsers would just be able to like speak natively to, to to these uh protocols that can store like uh front-end assets that that's great but in like that's like far away so in the short term yeah like we've been sort of looking at like what's the most pragmatic interim compromise we can make that tries to achieve like maximum trustlessness but sort of accept that somewhere along the pipeline right now with modern browsers, there's probably going to have to be some sort of trust delegated to like web to web to infra. Um, but how can we minimize that? How can we maybe, um, how can we sort of maybe verify that what we're like, what we're doing is sort of is, uh, is what we're expecting to have to have been done like obviously that's that's possible within ipfs verifying verifying the content that sort of stuff um so yeah 
to, to the long and short of it is like can we move away from trusted third party hosts that are responsible for serving front ends to some kind of model where um normal users that aren't technically sophisticated are kind of empowered to be able to operate like a power user that maybe is more sophisticated and could run their own own front end or download source it code and run it for it. um and uh how can we do that in like a web2 friendly way so that we don't break web2 experience which is like i want to be able to click a link and then effectively see a front end but maybe what happens behind the scenes is actually something completely different to the normal web2 experience um can i type a url in and see a front end you know we don't want to break, break that sort of web2 thing um but yeah for for me it's really important that like whatever kind of direction uh liquidity goes in for this solution is that it is completely usable by normal users like it can't be only power users that sort of can really use this tech which is kind of where i see it is right now like you can't do we can't use the like ipfs or whatever without having a browser extension installed or without having uh ipfs like node running or something you know third-party software running so the goal for me is to like move away from that where there is no browser extension or third-party software this is all 100 percent in the browser platform um and yeah why because like so like quite a common occurrence in like DeFi apps unfortunately is dns takeover or domain hacks and users end up losing funds because they don't realize they're being served a malicious front end so um if we can get away from these trusted third parties like to sovereign front ends like locally installed or something like that you know um then you sort of move away from that problem like if you're serving your own front end code, you don't have to worry that it's not malicious because it's coming from your local machine. I mean, yeah, like D DNS hacks don't really apply to that kind of thing. It just removes that category of risk, which is really nice. So there's like user benefits, but then from a regulatory point of view, um, again, I'm not a legal expert, but like my understanding and reading of Mika and the like European legislation that's coming to D for, for DeFi protocols is that they're really like there is a legitimate framework to 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 work through to to, to be categorized as decentralized and not come under um all this sort of uh legislative like uh restrictions that you normally would if you were sort of operating and in that legislation it mentions things like there are many front ends running rather than a central party running a single front end um like they were that, that would get categorized as like not decentralized so it seems like there's a requirement on the dap author side to actually have a number of front ends running rather than a single point of access or a single single like centrally hosted front end yeah does that make sense i think i've mentioned i i think that make that makes sense to me i think maybe if i maybe i can propose some like of the specific things that move us towards maybe like the the end of the year thing which is um we have you you've uh you have this in install that land uh demo uh, or, or poc we should make sure we can get it to do sort of the trustless gateway thing mm -hmm. um and you know so we'll still have basically relying on um if you have a dns or an ens name we'll rely on something like you know cloudflare or doh to resolve that for now yeah and that's kind of like the step one is basically that which includes the work underneath for you know supporting the uh the various gateway rendering components 
in JavaScript. So, you know, redirects and index.html and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and that can be, you know, you know, again, if it's that point you're sort of if you're you're backed by some central infra but you're validating all the data that's sent to you at the very least you've avoided the someone can send me a bad dap that takes my funds <laughs> problem mm -hmm. um and maybe take that and then start reaching out to some some other like groups and users to see like does this ux like basically make sense um and if the UX, you know, seeing how the feedback from that goes, will send us down the UX changing path mm -hmm. while there's separately a like add more decentralization to the system path, which is probably, which, you know, we can figure out what goes next, but it's probably something like either enabling more fetching of the data to go into the browser or figuring or handling um things like ENS resolution mm -hmm. in the browser. Um right. there's sort of an interesting uh um in a in a in a world where IPFS is like does hash ha do hashes, move them around, validate them. Um the the ETH RP the ETH RPC calls, uh there's one called ETH get proof which is almost exactly the same conceptually as the trustless gateway request for a car file. It's just that instead of using Unix FS, it uses Ethereum state. <laughs> um, and so, and there are some other projects like, uh, like Helios that are basically, Hey, can we do some like light client D basically validation of the state in the uh, validation of the state? And maybe I can even, you know, run it in a browser and do it this way. This is probably worth talking to those folks, but that maybe is like the, yeah, that, that's like, that's like the, that's like the next rung on the ladder, um, which if we have that, we'll really make it so that um, you can move to the, is everything safe? Is everything like safely loaded? into the browser, how many, the number of parties that can, you know, screw with how the data is loaded is like really low, right? It's like people who take over the ENS name or, um, you know, if all of the people who send you Ethereum checkpoints are lying to you, which seems like a lot. <laughs> um, and maybe yeah. that's like kind of the order of event, some of the order of events. Yes. And the, and yeah. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that like a lot of users may already be have may already have like a browser or an, an extension which can do some of this, uh, like um, ENS resolution or using Brave and it can just like resolve ENS and also has an IPFS node running, um, which is great. Like by default, it'd be cool if like the solution could use what the user already has and where it doesn't it kind of progressively degrades trustlessness or whatever, like towards more trust, whatever, like whatever compromise it has to make. So for me, I think this, the, the weakest part of the whole solution is dependence on like public ENS gateways. Um, because yeah, if the user is not running something like brave or, uh, a metamask or something that can resolve ENS, then the only thing I could see we could use are these sort of public ENS gateways like uh, eth.limo, eth.link, eth.li, eth.castle, all those things. And obviously then there is quite a lot of trust being put in those gateways. And I'm not sure whether there is a, you know, whether there's an opportunity there to actually verify, like, Re reduce the trust or well, sorry remove the trust or verify i know you can reduce the trust but uh by simply saying like you know we only ever have to hit this place once to down to, to to get something but after that it's stored locally and we won't ever actually do a network call in the browser the next time we we, we visit this uh ens gateway um 
you know, there's things like that where you can reduce the number of times you have to trust from n, like n times that you visit to, to, to just one, which is at least slightly better, but still, like, yeah, still not perfect. Uh, Lytle, uh, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of got like two questions. I guess like maybe the 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 one uh, goes back to the legal concerns. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the EU legislation uh, has a criteria for uh, having more than one instance of front end hosted somewhere. My understanding is this is like a web two in web two terms. It's on the different domain names owned by different entities. Um, so question is like, do we know when that legislation get, gets like uh, like ratified and gets into um, hold? That's a good question. I don't know the dates, but I can find them. Because um, uh, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my high level understanding is that it's now reached like non-changing so it shouldn't change uh and then it's sort of 2024 is 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 rolling out but yeah i could i i, I could find that uh, okay. for you yeah my, my brief recollection is there's there's like yeah the, the train is moving and that there's some like phase in period where if you start something in the next like six months you get you get like a your clock gets delayed for when you have to start dealing with the legislation and that if you start something in like you know eight months, then you're in the new regime already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I I, I guess like I have a kind of good news here because um, if the interpretation is uh, from the Web two perspective and the way the the original isolation works in 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 the old web, it's already solved in that you can have a DNS link and you can load it from every public gateway. And you have uh, multiple instances, and you can prove that those are operated by different entities. Um, so the question is, uh, I'd say, how can we leverage that in a way to solve the other problem, which is the DNS? And that the, it's the same problem as ENS in my mind, because. Uh, do I trust ENS smart contracts? Do I trust Ethereum more than uh, a simple SHA hash? I don't know. It's easier to understand how SHA works. Um, so the question is, um, maybe like this. Uh, maybe like what, what I'm thinking is that it's way easier to design for that end state where you don't have to make any trust concessions. I don't want to trust anyone, any DNS resolver. I don't want to trust any ENS. I'm a power user which runs local IPFS node or gateway. How would I want to have a control how the my user experience should look like to have a CID of the DAP wallet or a DeFi up and be sure it the thing that loaded in the browser is exactly that CID without trusting anyone because sure that mm. will be like small yeah. percentage of people but the, by the fact that we are designing for that end state we also have like that uh, uh, gracious fallback okay so if someone runs local node, they don't have to trust ENS or mm -hmm. DNS at all because mm -hmm. they know CID directly from developer or they pin that version because they want to control when they upgrade. Then if you are okay with like uh, the developer or, or, or the DAP to control where to update, then you may use e e ENS or DNS DNS link. And if you do that, on your local node, then you only added concession for DNS resolution. Then if you don't want to run local node, you may do another concession and load the same thing, but from some public gateway that you trust. So now you have a ecosystem effect where you don't, uh, you are not tied to um, this like uh, install, um, what was the name? Uh, I'm blanking. 
They the, installed that land from it. Yeah. So yeah. the the problem there is like it's a single DNS name, and ah. you need to trust uh, owner of the domain name. You also need to uh, you are under uh, terms of service of the dot land uh, TLD owner, and yeah. you also have terms of service of ICANN. So you got like three third yeah. parties, right? Yeah. So the thing is like how you leverage the fact that we already have public IPFS gateways operated by different entities and people are already able to choose them, right? So I yeah. feel that that's my mindset. And uh, I, I'm also like, it's very fresh in my mind, but it, it's the way I'm thinking about designing it. Like from the end state going back, it enables us to give people that like progression of trust. Okay, uh, yeah. To the point where you don't have to make any concessions. Yes. Yeah. So high level, that that is definitely the desirable end goal. Um, uh, that. Yeah. But that's something something important to to mention, and I didn't realize who here is or isn't familiar with install.land. Um, but something really important: install.land is not. That is not the. Um, that is not how a user would be served that installer app. That is literally just, I dumped it somewhere as a, to show people a demo, but the real installer that's in on currently being served from that domain, it, it, it's, it's not going to be served over DNS. Well, it's not gonna be served over anything I can, like any individual controls. It would be deployed to IPFS and then stored against an ENS record meaning that people would access it through installland.eth and then their browser would either um, do the resolution through their extension or natively through uh, Brave or they'd be have to use a public ENS gateway. So yeah, you're right that if you're if, if it's just on an install.land then yeah, you've got to trust whoever owns that, the .land TLD and DNS, whoever the registrar is. But that won't in if we were to actually push something out that we want users to use, it wouldn't be on install.land. It would be on uh, it would be an IPFS uh, stored file which is accessible via ENS resolution or public ENS gateways. And that's why I mentioned right at the start that the weakest point of this like thing that I've been looking into is the public ENS gateway because. Um, yeah, does that make more sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I t -t totally get it. It's kind of like I want to like do the one, like one step forward, remove yeah. that. When we design things, also design beyond the need for resolving. If I have you, if someone has the CID, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. The question is, um, yeah, it's, to do... it's too. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Like. We, we we need somewhere to like if we if we do have to come up with like this interim solution because we don't think browsers are there yet, then this needs that that interim solution needs to be some hosted somewhere. So that's at the moment it's just demoed on install.land, but the an actual the actual installer would be stored on a hopefully something that's way more uh you know decentralized, um, if that makes sense. So um yeah so 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 don't take install.land as the thing that we want would want people to use like like the address uh it wouldn't be that i think one sense. thing i i talked to Lytle about a little bit around this is that um there's there's sort of like a if you sort of break down to some of like the the core pieces of of like what's the request right so it's either there's the immutable request for a cid there's immutable request based on a name dns or, or ens or something uh and then there's like we'll call them like pet names right there was i i wanted a i wanted i i put in the cid the first time but i don't want to put in the cid the second time or something like that um and right now with with public gateways, right? You can handle the the case where it's a CID and you can handle the DNS case and you can handle the ENS case. Um, and you can even, you know, potentially get these things to serve up 
you know, some minimal JavaScript that will then load the rest of it for you. Um, and then you can have things like, you know, like Brave and or browsers that are, and things that have extensions like better, like, like uh, remove that trust from the endpoint for you. Um, but if, you know, for example, if one of the things that was missing was pet names and we have no standard for how we do that, there's no like, you know, uh, a Dean app dot pet dot D web dot link, then like we can figure that one out. Um, in order to basically allow for that, that upgrade slot that you were mentioning where like, if you already have a browser extension or a browser that has better support for this, that you can upgrade out of your, you can sort of upgrade your bootstrapping problem from, I trusted this, you know, public gateway for the initial loading of code to, I trusted the extension I installed or the browser I installed for the initial loading of code. Um, and so if we think, for example, that the pet name thing is, is like, is highly valuable that, and that's a missing link in our, let's call it the standard in our standardized process in our standards process where, you know, Brave or IPFS companion or MetaMask have like a, an upgrade path, um, then we should put some effort there. Um, I think that relates into this like getting UX feedback thing, which is I think we need to hear a little bit from like as we start, yeah, playing with this. Like, what are what are the UX things people need? Are people yeah. cool with the CIDs? Are people cool with pet names? Or do they really need like the DNS or ENS names to like feel happy? Yeah, and that's where the UX was important for me to have some human friendly name, and that's why ENS was what I was using. Uh, or th thinking is the best best option available right now, and and just just on mentioning like trusting ENS versus trusting DNS, the difference is the one is opaque and one's open source, so it's not a kind of the same trust. We're not putting trust in humans to operate some infrastructure in a in a reliable way. We're saying the source code of the smart contract for ENS is is verifiable with humans that can read source code, and therefore it's sort of like trustless in the sense that there's nothing, there's no trust in humans. You just have, you could say you have to trust the smart contracts, but that's, we're okay with that, at least in the DeFi world. Like we accept that you, the, the source code is is king, but if we can move away from these opaque systems like DNS, where we're, we're not aware of like what, who's, who's the admin, what was their OPSEC, what's the code that runs behind it on their servers to transparent code, that's, that's, um, that's acceptable. Um, at one other thing, the installer approach may not even be the best option here. I, that's just something that I think is um, really good for Mika and really good for uh, def users that care, like users, DeFi users that care about decentralization. But if there was an even, you know, more seamless way to just use infra to be served the front end or access a front end that doesn't involve having to install it locally, that would be acceptable too. I just think it really helps with the decentralization aspect if we're saying, look, we don't even have someone serving a front end. We have something that can distribute source code, but that source code gets stored on a user's local machine. And then at that point, that user is then self-serving their front end that they've got stored, which is not controlled by um, any, any, anyone else, there's a one-time access of the source code to store it. But beyond that, the user is self-serving. That's kind of the angle for the install.land concept, but definitely open to like other approaches that I haven't thought about. Uh, just a quick uh, kind of like feedback on the install land. I'd say it's a, it's a good, very good call because uh, it, solves a, an important problem of updates. So the pet names uh, solve the problem where if you change the CAD, you, like, you can take the CAD and just load the CAD today from your local gateway and you will load it trustlessly. The problem is 
if you just like have a wallet, you may have some like secrets, passwords, access tokens stored in a local storage. That storage is tied to the origin, which is based on the CID. You change the CID, you don't, no longer have access to the same thing. And you have to either like export and import every time uh, or have some other way of doing that. Uh, by pe having pet static pet name, you are able to upgrade to the new version of uh, like DAP. And yeah. all the permissions for camera, for additional disk storage, uh, they remain the same. And that's very, very important because yeah. it also solves the end game it like makes it like the surface of problems to solve there smaller because we already have per uh, IPNS identifier or per CID origin isolation. Uh, the IPNS and IPFS native URIs, they effectively are backed by the subdomain gateways, which create origin per the thing. So it's not just like cosmetics that people have nice names in the address bar. It's very important to get their like secret key, private keys uh when they upgrade and it also solves the problem of uh giving end user more options if you don't care about upgrades and you are comfortable with i don't know that op uh, owner to control you use the dns link uh pointing at dns or ens name but if you want to be in control when you upgrade then you use the pet name right so then there's a choice between who makes a decision when to update and I, I don't think we can make any like concessions on, on those things. I think the installer UX can be improved. We may have some sort of like a convention for like install my app. And if there's no, you know, pre-feel uh, the, the, the CAD or whatever, uh, like a, a button thing. Uh, but uh, that's just kind of like a, the, the end user UX design for on the, for the low level, I think we, uh, that the installer kind of like nails it in the head of the problem. Yes, I do. I do think it's possible to have immutable pet names. Like you could have, um, um, like if we have an ENS record, like Unis, like you could create an ENS. You can have ENS smart contracts that are non-upgradable. So whatever IPFS CID gets stored against Uniswap.eth could be immutable um which is which is nice because then it's if uniswap want to publish a new version it would come under a new record under uniswap.eth so it'd be something like v1 v2 dot uniswap.eth v3 so um i mean that's an open design space to say how could we do immutable uh how could we enable a new immutable ens records it's definitely possible within the smart contracts um and that would enable users to opt in to updates. So by default, they're only ever running locally the stored version that they installed. But with we can say, hey, look, Uniswap or whoever has published this new version, do you want to take in this update? And it becomes opt-in. Um, that's kind of how I saw the how I saw the 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 friendly ENS names working in an immutable way that enables users to stay in control of the version they're running. I have like a very, very quick, maybe like not quite. Yeah, I think it's a question. So I, we talk about like ENS being a bit harder, like sa safer or hardened than DNS. Uh, but the reality is it's, uh, it's highly centralized majority of clients resolve it using Cloudflare gateway, right? So there's this like a single DNS name uh, that if you censor it, effectively ENS resolution goes down on majority of dApps unless they do the actual proof fetching that Adil mentioned. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, because you can request like the ENS records over RPC to, uh, to Ethereum nodes and like you say, verify um, without using any public ENS gateways or service providers, you know, that that is an option. Um, yes, yeah, so that's why I think like the, you know, if, if uh, try and like, this is all really helpful. I'm trying to go back and see if we can hit the like highest priority items thing, which I think is 
all of the things required to comply with the gateway spec need to work with like trustless gateway rendering in JavaScript um, such that we can integrate into, into the POC. And then there are maybe some aspects around um, the, let's call it like the, the integration point, like the, the service worker -y things that would be nice to have around, let's call them upgrade paths where you don't get a worse experience that where you don't, where you don't get anything out of the fact that you have like, you know, brave or something installed local or IPFS companion installed locally. Um, that can help with this. Um, and so that's probably like, th those seem like sort of generically helpful things that also move up, that move us in, in the right direction here. Um, and that allow us to handle sort of the, the immutability case. We punt off on some of the mutability trust points, right? Whether it's the Cloudflare resolution or, you know, for ENS or whatever for later. Um, and then we can take some sort of background time to make some of the connections with people. Um, I'm happy to take in an AI there, like an action item there to like reach out to, uh, reach out to some, some folks in, in that space around what it would take to say, put something like, you know, put something like Helios in the browser to do ENS resolution. Um, and, and what that looks like. Um, I think that that whole thing is probably like a, a slightly longer story too, because I don't know what the security audits have been like on the 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 browser Ethereum state crawling clients. Um, but I did mention it to some some people who work on sort of ETH security stuff when I was um, when I was in Prague, and there seemed to be. Uh, so I'm like, oh yeah, that does kind of make sense. If people, we want to start pushing people into the browsers, we probably need to make sure that like what they're doing there is <laughs> is safe. Um, that's going to be like a longer thread, but I think it's okay for that to be like a background thread while we do sort of, can I make the CID thing work? And and then, you know, can we figure out what we want to do with, um, you know, making the the UX there solid? Does that does that kind of make sense to people? Because once we have that, we can also start saying things like, "Oh, do we have to start looking at the, you know, doing benchmarks for comparisons and performance? Right? Is performance going to be a big problem for us, even on the in, in the immutability space? Because then it doesn't matter what happens in the immutability space if performance is a problem, people are going to feel like they're hurting until we solve that, right? Um. So is that? Uh, maybe if I'm more concrete, I can sort of write it down, but basically trustless gateway retrieval that is, you know, fully spec compliant in browser, you know, service worker things that work with this properly and sort of upgrade into, you know, at least if you have brave, they like let you upgrade into that process instead of doing it all yourself. Um, and then figuring out what we need from the naming perspective as we're doing the UX and showing it to people. And if we can, you know, sort of make, make some progress there uh, or solid progress there um, by the end of the year, that, that, that feels pretty good, I think. Maybe it's too many things, but <laughs> we'll find out. So, Adin, uh, I think it really it requires even more sort of explicit definition of what you mean by doing the loading through the trustless gateway in the browser does that mean loading all resources of a page and and verifying all of it in the browser or just doing all the sub resources so to say because i mean the, the, the if it's the whole page then it has to go through some kind of an installer that you're loading into the browser, which then does the loading and fetching through the trustless gateway. Yeah, so I guess it's like there is at a library level the thing that means fetching all the fetching and rendering all of the resources, right? So given that you're at the root, 
doing the thing that's like, oh yeah, I have to follow the, I have to follow redirects. I have to handle the fact that I'm a directory and I have an index.html file in me and, and all of that. Right. Um, there's the service worker chunks that when I'm doing that, I make sure I'm properly handling, um, relative paths and stuff and make sure that all of that is working properly. Uh, then there's the, we'll call it the, the bootstrapping thing of how do I start with this, which is the installer, which is, I guess, like a, a separate task. And so I think these are all kind of like, these seem like they're probably like sort of independent, relatively independent tasks where when people are working on them, they probably won't be stepping on each other's toes too much. Um, Cause it's kind of like the, let's call it the, the IPLD ish layer, layer, the browser integration layer. Right. And then like this like UX installer layer. And maybe the server, maybe the browser integration and the UX installer are like a little close together, but they're probably far enough away from the 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 IPLD-ish layer that um people won't have to worry about that when they're working on the other stuff. That sort of does that make is that are there any are there any next steps different from those that seem more important? Okay, I guess everyone's in agreement then. Um, that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, we have only a few minutes left. Um, I think it would be useful to formulate yeah. what we what we just said. It was hard for me to both take it in and write yeah. it while doing that. Okay. But I think uh, it would be good to formulate that in writing just so that we can have really uh, something explicit that we agree to. Oh, come on. Give me a break. Let me try to share it so you can write. Okay. Everyone should be able to write now with, uh, they should be able to reload it and. Okay. Edit it without logging in. Oh, I was logged in too. That's okay. All right. Um, so next steps. Uh, library for the gateway resolution. Um, yeah, we probably will split this, have a separate, this will be like a, this will include a, a library which someone can use in their own service worker. Because this is like the yeah. full turnkey solution, but there's still value in having that small, smaller thing. I just want to add to my service worker a, a thing that will do the IPFS for the IPFS paths. Um, that's kind of like a side artifact of will come out of this work. But I think it may be useful to productize that first in that dApps, which may not be like fully decentralized, are able to start using content address data and load it actually peer to peer before the entire thing is decentralized. Um, because if we wait until we got like the full gateway working reliably with redirects and index HTML and all the things, then uh, that may take some time. We should be able to deliver that uh, smaller uh, service worker verifier library because there's a, the surface is way smaller. It's just uh, you need to return bytes for a file. Yeah, is this is this sort of right? These are kind of our three steps, right? So we have the library, we have the service worker that handles kind of the basics of how this works. Then we have sort of the 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 fuller like app installer thing, um, and sort of these are sort of the the next things we do, and then and then from there we can sort of reevaluate and see. Um, and see sort of like the, the next steps that will probably come from seeing what changes from the UX, what things from the UX layer we need to either standardize or change. Um, 
uh, to make it easier for people. Um, and then, you know, we'll sort of, uh, oh, no, all right. Uh, yeah, and I'll just put like a, you know, I'll say this is a background task and I'll do this one. Um, it is, you know, reach out around the um, uh, sort of verifiable ETH RPC things. Um, cause we don't have to do this. This doesn't have to happen now, but, uh, finding the right people, talking to them can, can take some time. So it's probably better to like start, start knocking on doors now so that when we need it, um, it will be there. Yeah. I would add another background task and you can assign it to me. It's kind of like pet names, spec, local pet names, spec proposal for gateways. Um, uh, Probably I, I should be able to have some a draft for the next time. For the next time we have this um, meeting, so we can uh, discuss uh, standardization in the background, and that's important for the proliferation of this installer across all gateways, public, local, and also in Brave, and making sure the UX is the same across all the runtimes. But that's like a you know, not a blocker, just by takes longer time. So we should start okay. as soon as possible. Um and Ed, do do you know um I have two two uh questions. One is does liquidity does the liquidity app make use of um is it does it just need sort of the static assets and then like an ETH RPC client? Is that like all is that all it needs to do its thing? Or does it yes. need more stuff underneath? It's exactly that. Yeah. So for okay. quite yeah, a bunch a bunch of um like for us, we're literally just static uh HTML, JS, CSS, but and and most DeFi front ends are because of the fact that the server component is just RPC calls to, uh, to, to, to Ethereum nodes. Um, uh, but there are, I, I'm aware of front ends that also run their own server infra for, I don't know, optimizing caching stuff. Um, but, but everything I've proposed here so far is compatible with that. So like, yeah, quite a key component of this is like in my head is that DeFi projects don't have to do anything different to what they already do. As long as they publish their source code, then ideally this solution can work with that. As long as that source code is addressable over the internet. Um, so for example, Uniswap are a great model because they publish their source code to GitHub and they publish it to IPFS. Um, so this thing I'm proposing installer, installer land, like Uniswap wouldn't have to do anything it would just work out the box in this solution. I think that's quite key is that we don't like, from my perspective, don't try to make DeFi app authors have to like reinvent the wheel or code in any different way to how they normally would, which is just producing their static HTML and JS and all that. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And ideally we get it to a point where it's, um, is usable enough that, you know, instead of app dot, you know, swap.com just loading the thing, they feel comfortable redirecting to something like this that would, mm. you know, han handle this for them. Basically, like, encourage this to be like the default instead of the fallback um, as much as possible and see what what the problem is, what the what sort of the, the blockers are in getting to that kind of a space. For sure. I just for my side for next steps, like I'm aware just of how far away install.land that you can currently look at is yeah. from the concept I have in my head. So I think for next time, I, hope, I, I plan to actually have a deployed version to IPFS using ENS gateway as its access point. So you can sort of get a better picture of how this subdomain auto resolution to DeFi protocols would work. And uh, also a diagram illustrating the end-to-end -end process and showing which actors are involved, which parts have trust, which parts are trustless, that sort of thing. Okay. 
It's really cool. Um, I guess, sorry, we're, we're a little late. I will throw out maybe one more thing, uh, which is um, there, the time for the next uh, meeting uh, is scheduled. I think it's is, is next Tuesday. Um, I think it's maybe an, an hour or two after the current time. These were times I kind of just made up. Uh, if you are, if if you would like, if you would like a different time than this, uh, feel free to reach out to me on on the the Telegram channel, um, or or Filecoin Slack, or or however you want to find me, um, uh, and just ping there and say, hi, actually this doesn't work for me, and we'll send out another Doodle poll, and we will find a time that works consistently for people, um, across the board. Maybe it's this hour. I don't know. Um, but otherwise, we'll see you all next week. Um, awesome. Thanks so much thanks for, for your time. Thanks a lot for setting this up. Really appreciate uh, everyone coming together for it. Cheers, guys. <laughs>